The development of bronze technology gave us the Bronze Age. Acquired knowledge of iron, the Iron Age. And when we learned about semiconductors such as silicon, the foundation was laid for the world to enter the Information Age. The field called material science is relatively young. It blends knowledge from physics, chemistry, and engineering, and the products it is creating today may be forming the groundwork for an entirely new age. We need to develop new materials for the progress, but we also need to reinvent the materials because some of the materials that we have taken for granted in the past are not sustainable in the future. And with increasing population, increasing density of the cities, the challenges that the society faces when it comes to the sustainability of materials is really key for survival of the humankind. At the Ångström Laboratory in Uppsala, Professor Albert Moranian is leading a research team in creating innovative applications for using an old, well-known material in new ways. The material they're working with is cellulose. The creation of paper from cellulose is a technology with more than 2,000 years behind it, originating in ancient China. In Sweden, where Albert Moranian is conducting his research, they also have a tradition of working with cellulose. Filter paper is a Swedish invention. It was known together with the German grades of filter paper as the best filter paper. The Swedish scientist Berzelius was first to suggest that we use paper in chemical analysis to separate particles from solutions. In Uppsala, Albert and his team are giving this Swedish tradition a critical update. Their filters can trap particles that are so small they can only be seen with a microscope. This process normally involves uh, several um, steps in which first uh, you prepare a slurry of uh, cellulose, in our case cellulose nanofibers, and then this slurry is uh, drained over another filter holder and then uh, to produce a filter cake. And then this wet cake is uh, pressed and dried to produce the filter paper. So it's very straightforward actually. The nanofilter could be used, for example, to purify drugs in the pharmaceutical industry. But there are other more common, though equally important, areas where it can be useful. 350,000 children under age of five die due to bad water, and more than 90% of these cases could be prevented. We can uh, remove even the smallest and most resistant uh, to disinfection microorganisms, such as viruses, from water as easily as brewing coffee. The filters we have today, uh, they're too expensive to be used on large scale. So our filter, which is cost efficient, could be the solution of the future. <laughs> Albert Moranian's invention is a good example of how ancient discoveries can be combined with new knowledge, leading to important advances in science. In the 20th century, new knowledge of semiconducting materials like silicon and germanium leads to the creation of basic electronic components such as the transistor and the diode. So a lot of modern technology is relying on the proper functioning of these materials. And I think what you found out is that we can functionalize and modify their properties so that actually we can mold the response to our desire. Alexander Bolatsky is a professor of theoretical physics at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. He and his team used the physical laws and mathematical formulas 
to calculate and attempt to predict how different materials in different situations will react at the atomic level. Yeah, yeah. Their primary focus is on a group of materials that can form the foundation for a next-generation technology called Dirac materials. So it takes a special set of circumstances to create this kind of Dirac material. But precisely because there are some special circumstances, these Dirac nodes or Dirac lines, they're very sensitive to external fields. And that's where the interest is, because it basically allows us to functionalize and control the response of Dirac materials more easily than in conventional metals. Okay. So we can do some... Dirac materials conduct electricity as well or better than many metals, but they are easier to control and manipulate thanks to the so-called Dirac nodes, which are of particular value when it comes to finely calibrated technology. One of the more known Dirac materials is graphene, a form of carbon. Carbon is an element that can take several different forms, the diamond being one of the most famous. Graphite, among others, used in tennis rackets and ordinary pencils, is another. And then we have graphene, a single thin layer of carbon atoms. So what's interesting about graphene is that in the plane it has the same stiffness properties as, as diamond. It has the strength exceeding the stainless steel strength. And then at the same time, being two-dimensional, it's very bendable. So there is a lot of mechanical properties of graphene. But the problem, of course, is that you cannot see it with the naked eye, and so it takes special techniques to see it. Working with a material that is so thin that it is described as two-dimensional requires both specific knowledge and special techniques. Graphene is delivered on a copper plate, which is then dissolved in an acid bath, so that only graphene remains. Only then can it be moved to a base plate of silicon so that the material's special properties can be used. So graphene has a unique optical properties, magnetic uh, properties. It has very, very interesting electronic transport properties because of Dirac nodes. With different laboratories at the Royal Institute's Shista campus, the team can test their theories in practice. They examine how Dirac materials react when exposed to various things, like the intense light from a laser cannon. The goal is to find practical uses for these relatively newly discovered materials. Scientists are already talking about uses for everything from solar panels and composite materials for aircraft to hypersensitive sensors and tomorrow's batteries and electronics. Graphene, in addition to have very unusual electronic properties, as we mentioned, has a very uh, interesting mechanical properties. So the people in particular talk about, for instance, personal or verbal electronics, meaning actually that you have electronics that are inherently flexible. And that's where this flexibility, structural stability of graphene comes in as well. Because it might be a basis for the future electronics and applications where silicon and germanium would be hard to implement. Material science is a field that has developed rapidly in recent decades. With greater focus being given to tailoring the properties of a particular material to suit a specific need. Without the technological knowledge of how to work with different metals, we wouldn't have the art of bookmaking. Without glass, no microscopes or telescopes. And what today's breakthroughs will lead to in the future, we can only guess. It used to be that we would go out and investigate the nature, materials that mostly occur naturally. Then semiconductors come in where we know that we can modify the properties by changing the synthesis. Now, we, we're doing the same, but on much smaller atomic nanoscale level. And so this ability to control the matter at the atomic scale, that what led to the discovery that we can, in fact, create artificial materials, materials that don't even exist in the nation. So that's what the future is. <laughs>